Take rapid action. Get productive, motivated, and energized. Stop overthinking and procrastinating. Written by Patrick King. Narrated by Russell Newton. Act or Accept. Anonymous. In light of the theme of this book, I opted to skip the introduction and get right to the meat of the matter so you can, of course, take action more rapidly. Overthinking is the antithesis of springing into action and the place where we start when we think about taking action. Either we do what's necessary or we engage in the mental hamster wheel that keeps us stuck in place equals no action. Thinking too much is the mortal enemy of getting started and can seduce you into mistakenly believing that you've done your duty because it can sometimes be so tiring equals no action. Most often, it occurs when we fail to draw a distinction between the proper amount of due diligence and obsessive fixation equals no action. Suppose you want to start a business and you've been dreaming about it for months. You have all the details planned in your head, and the list of questions you need answers to only seems to grow without ever shrinking. What if everything fails? What if you lose all your money? What if not a single person buys your product? What kind of forks should you have in the company cafeteria? How will you deal with your taxes? What type of animal will the company mascot be? Now, some of these are important questions, but some are not, especially not at the current moment when they have no relevance or urgency to the greater task at hand. Nonetheless, you find yourself wasting away precious hours tossing and turning in bed while analyzing everything at 3 a.m. Your mind is going a mile a minute because you're playing out all the possible scenarios in your head. You can't seem to shut off your brain, even when you're physically exhausted, and yet you're zero steps closer to turning your thoughts into a reality. You tell yourself to stop thinking about it and get into motion, but you simply can't stop thinking about the what-ifs. You're tired, you lose sleep, and you're confused by distracting thoughts, some fixated on failure and problems as a reflection of your insecurities, and some that don't matter at all, but are disguised as important. Instead of taking action, you feel paralyzed by your planning. Things have to go well, and you can't risk any type of failure, so you keep forecasting and trying to predict the future. There are just too many thoughts swirling around your head, and since you feel so overwhelmed, it's like you've lost even before you've started and your business has never begun. To a certain extent, overthinking about problems in particular is important because it helps you navigate everyday life. As a human being, you're hardwired to worry about what can go wrong. Danger used to be lurking behind every bush, after all. This tendency allows you to think of all possible scenarios and prepare to survive. This keeps you out of trouble and safe more often than not. In moderation, it's an admirable trait. But that's not why you're reading this book. This type of overactive, hyperactive mental chatter has a considerable downside. You can't think and do at the same time. Perhaps for the brain, a lack of action is truly the safest way to live, but it ignores that doing is the only thing we're measured by in this world. Your overactive mind will hold you back from everything, from the easiest tasks to calculated risks. At the basic level, overthinking can make you tired, scared, and stuck in life. In more extreme cases, overthinking can cause anxiety and shut you out completely from your goals, desires, and beliefs. As you'll read here, our brains are quite adept at sabotaging our best intentions. Is it just as easy to quiet your mind as stepping into a soundproof room? Well, no, that's a tough habit to crack. But at the very least, there are ways to redirect that extra energy you use to run in place and avoid taking a single step forward. These methods start with zeroing in on what you spend your overthinking quota on and how to cut it shorter. Follow the Ostrich's Lead According to a popular myth, ostriches instinctively bury their heads in the sand when they sense trouble because it makes them feel safer. It is supposedly a defense mechanism akin to the saying, out of sight, out of mind. In reality, these beautiful birds don't really live that way. As fast animals, possessing enormously powerful legs, they're better off trying to outrun trouble or stomp it into submission with said legs. In the finance world, 
The ostrich theory refers to how investors will simply avoid looking at stocks and related information if they know there's a chance that their numbers are down. It refers to the human tendency to avoid confirming danger in order to feel safe and not affirm the worst. It appears that, psychologically, a sense of ignorance is preferable to a tangible negative. It may not make logical sense, but it sure feels good to our sense of comfort. It allows you to deny your worst feelings because you don't know for sure that the negative consequent exists. Without knowing the reality of the situation, you don't have to face it, even if you have a strong notion it's lurking just around the corner. People typically demonstrate this behavior when they don't want to confront a harsh truth or unpleasant situation. For instance, if you have a feeling that you've gained weight, then, despite your doctor telling you that you're obese, you may avoid all mirrors and scales for the time being. What you don't know won't hurt you, right? The ostrich theory plays on the protective instincts of human nature. While most rightfully view the ostrich theory as something negative, it can actually be beneficial to our overarching goal of prioritizing action over thinking. How exactly is that? A large aspect of overthinking focuses on fears and insecurities. We're terrified of judgment, rejection, or flat-out failure. So having our heads in the sand and not being constantly bombarded by these worst-case scenarios can help us make a leap instead of analyzing every fearful possibility. It might seem that I'm encouraging you to ignore important signs that can potentially teach you a lot. That's definitely not the case. The point I'm making is most of the negative chatter is indeed useless, and you'd be better served completely ignoring these thoughts. They only serve to implant an extraneous what-if in your head and raise your alarms. When you overthink, you have the tendency to treat everything as urgent and important. In fact, sometimes that's what we subconsciously want to do in order to avoid action. However, it's far from reality. So when you occasionally engage in the ostrich theory and cut off a certain percentage of your negative chatter, the more likely the chance, however small, that you'll take action. It comes down to willful ignorance, something that is also typically seen as negative. Keep yourself unaware of unnecessary information that will only throw off your focus, no matter if it's positive or negative. Willful ignorance is when you're able to distinguish what really matters at the moment and tune out everything else. The way to put the ostrich theory into action is to occasionally bury your head in the sand. Intentionally limit the amount of information you intake. For instance, purposefully detox from the news or stay away from social media. Consider the only complaints or opinions of a select few whom you proactively seek out. Don't check your texts or emails before you take the first step. Set an upper limit for how many articles you will read concerning a potential problem. Block out certain concerns by diminishing returns. If you already know about a potential problem, you already know about it. By source, we all have these negative influences in our lives. Immediacy, some things simply don't matter at the moment. If you're at step four, then why worry about step 15? Or category. What you're worried about may not actually impact the end goal or purpose. Going back to the business example from earlier, you can stop researching your competitors and how much they make. Willful ignorance may be detrimental by itself, but when you pair it with obsessive overthinking and procrastination, it can balance you out. Other businesses may not be focused on how to simply get your first client instead of going up against an entrenched competitor. It might feel like something is falling through the cracks if you don't obsessively overthink and research, but the truth is, you'll learn far more from taking the first step and gaining first-hand experience rather than planning from the sidelines. As it turns out, experience is truly the best teacher and planner. Use the ostrich theory to try to get to that step sooner rather than later. So, strap on a pair of blinders, limit your vision to only your immediate concerns, and walk forward step by step. The Pre-Mortem Analysis If you truly can't stomach the thought of starting something without analyzing a complete plan, you can try making a pre-mortem analysis. Think of it as a more strategic way of overthinking that cuts down on the length that we so desire. 
The pre-mortem analysis was invented by psychologist Gary Klein and works by looking ahead to scenarios where you failed and working backwards to find causes, weaknesses, threats, and flaws. The more well-known post-mortem analysis looks at a situation, analyzes what went wrong, and finds a solution after the fact. The pre-mortem attempts to do this before the fact to avoid those flaws. This creates a laser focus for your mental chatter, instead of being overwhelmed with everything and anything. Now, this type of analysis has value for its own sake. Instead of trying to plan everything you need for success, change your approach and plan what to do to avoid failure. Focus on avoiding one type of outcome as opposed to seeking another out. This type of analysis can help you plan better and more effectively for the long term, and it forces you to look at your strategies from a different perspective. It's simple and can help avoid potential pitfalls in any endeavor, which is what we're typically most afraid of. Because you allow yourself to fail on paper, you're able to highlight possible problems that you might have otherwise missed because you were thinking of so many things. How does this aid with taking action? The pre-mortem analysis only gives you one scenario or set of variables to think about. Failure. It's easier to think in an organized manner when you only have to imagine one outcome. It cuts all the other chatter out of your mind and streamlines your thoughts. This type of analysis spotlights the most important factor and organizes just a few scenarios to think through. Imagine the failure, brainstorm some potential causes, see how you can address them, or if you can at all, and then jump. This approach to action strikes a large contrast with the type of unorganized and scattered thought that typically holds you back. Of course, this is only if you can actually use the pre-mortem analysis to replace your other mental chatter, instead of adding it to your checklist of things to fret about. That's the tough step, but hopefully using this analysis once or twice will show you how much information it can yield so you can start to forego other thoughts. Let's take an example of imagining how a hypothetical business will fail. Imagine the year is 2023 and your organic baby food business just went bankrupt. Let's assume you lost money every year since 2021. If you were to make a hypothesis, what are the causes of a future failure? You probably know what to focus your efforts on, so what happened? What went wrong? Zoom in on the possible causes of failure based on what you're worried about right now. Was it inadequate market research? Was there ineffective communication in your organization? Was it a competitor? Margins that were too thin to begin with? Ask what you can do with only those four factors at the current moment. If the answer is nothing, which is likely, make a note for later and then jump into action. After all, the thing you're most worried about is failure. So in theory, you've just addressed your greatest threats. Four clear threads of thought beats ten disorganized ones. Once you thoroughly think about how to avoid failure, what's left other than to make an attempt to prove yourself right or wrong? Engage only in your pre-mortem analysis and resist planning paralysis. Gathering more information than you absolutely need, conducting multiple analyses of different ways to achieve something, combing over minute and usually unnecessary details, Debating back and forth in your own head about multiple scenarios, all of these actions are used as something that will postpone your taking action. After all, it's easier to plan than to do. Planning in itself is a comfort zone, and not only because you can do it from a couch. To do something, you have to get outside and risk a certain vulnerability. So it's always easier to keep planning, because technically, it's useful to your task. You can lead yourself to believe you're being productive toward your overall goal. Keep in mind that overplanning is an often redundant process that people hide behind. Finally, the pre-mortem forces you to think only in terms of pertinent knowledge as opposed to just-in-case knowledge. Just-in-case knowledge is information that you're not sure you'll need, but you want to overthink on just in case an improbable and unlikely situation comes to pass. You might understand this better in the case of an extensive wardrobe, packed with a pink feathered scarf and a pair of purple military fatigue sweatpants, just in case you happen to attend an eccentric neon theme night somewhere. 
At some point, you'll likely realize that what you're preparing for, just in case, is really never to occur. As has been mentioned, being prepared is an admirable trait, but this book is aimed at kicking us into gear more frequently and consistently. To do so, you must risk feeling slightly less prepared by understanding that a lot of what you're using to hold yourself back from action is not important and is in fact just in case based knowledge that will ultimately be useless. Plutarch once famously wrote, Spartans do not ask how many are the enemy, but where are they? The meaning? The Spartans would be there to fight any enemy, regardless of how many there were, and additional information wouldn't change their tactics in any way. The number was not important, so they only gathered the minimum information they needed and went forth with action. The Don't Do List Sometimes when we're overthinking, it's because we can't choose what to first turn our attention to. Too many things have the potential to command our focus, and sometimes we can't differentiate between what we should avoid and what actually deserves our attention. We also may feel that everything is urgent and important. Thus, the focus of this section is to make crystal clear what you should be avoiding. It's similar to the ostrich theory and willful ignorance in that you need to be intentional about what you feel like you're letting go of. In reality, you aren't letting go. You're streamlining. Now, everyone knows the value of the to-do list. No doubt you've stumbled across tips elsewhere about using a to-do list to increase productivity and your ability to take action. My point is that everyone inherently kind of knows what they should be doing and when they need to do it by. The act of writing it down just helps remind them and keep them accountable. This makes them more likely to do what they know they should be doing, more than if they didn't have such a list. But not everyone knows what they shouldn't be doing. Each day, we're faced with trying to figure out what will create the biggest impact for us, and sometimes we spend time we don't have trying to make this choice. Again, we all know the obvious evils to avoid when trying to upgrade productivity social media, goofing around on the internet, watching The Bachelorette while trying to work, or learning to play the flute while reading. It can be difficult to distinguish between real tasks and useless tasks, and it will require some hard thought on your part. If you're lucky, you may find that you put almost everything onto your don't-do list, leaving an obvious path for you to take action. You need to fill your don't-do list with tasks that will sneakily steal your time and undermine your goals. These are tasks that, one, are insignificant, two, are a poor use of your time, three, don't help your bottom line or end purpose, and four, have a serious case of diminishing returns the more you work on them. If you continuously waste your time on these tasks, your real priorities will fall by the wayside. I've identified three general types of tasks to put on your don't-do list. First, tasks that are priorities, but you can't do anything about them at present because of external circumstances. These are tasks that are important in one or many ways, but are waiting for feedback from others or for underlying tasks to be completed first. Put these on your don't-do list because there's literally nothing you can do about them. Don't spend your mental energy thinking about them. They'll still be there when you hear back from those other people. Just note that you're waiting to hear back from someone else and the date on which you need to follow up if you haven't heard back. Then, push these out of your mind, because they're on someone else's to-do list, not yours. The ball is in someone else's court, for better or worse. Second are tasks that don't add value as far as your main goals and projects are concerned. There are many small items that don't add to your bottom line, and often these are trivial things, busy work. Do they really require your time? For that matter, are they worth your time? These tasks are just a wasted motion for the sake of motion and don't really matter in the big picture. This is where we come to differentiating between aimless motion and actual intentional action. They're easily disguised as each other, right down to the fact that they both feel good to engage in. However, one delivers an outcome that you want, action, and the other is something that doesn't accomplish anything in the end, motion. 
You can spend a lot of time investigating gyms and researching workout routines, but if you never step foot inside of one, that's a whole lot of wasted motion running on a hamster wheel. So you should spend your time on bigger tasks that speak to your overall goals and not myopic, trivial tasks. Often, these are useless tasks disguised as important ones, such as selecting the paint color for the bike shed in the parking lot of the nuclear power plant you're building. Third, include tasks that are current and ongoing, but will not benefit from additional work or attention paid to them. These tasks suffer from diminishing returns. These projects are just a waste of energy because, while they can still stand to improve, and is there anything that can't? The amount of likely improvement will either not make a difference in the overall outcome or success, or will take a disproportionate amount of time and effort without making a significant dent. For all intents and purposes, these tasks should be considered done. Don't waste your time on them, and don't fall into the trap of considering them a priority. Once you finish everything on your plate, you can then evaluate how much time you want to devote to polishing something. If the task is at 90% of the quality you need it to be, it's time to look around at what else needs your attention to bring it from 0 to 90%. In other words, it's far more helpful to have three tasks completed at 80% quality versus one task at 100% quality. When you consciously avoid the items on your don't-do list, you keep yourself focused and streamlined. A don't-do list enables you to know exactly where your path should lead and what action to take on first. When you're at a fork in the road and each fork looks equally appealing, you're going to be stuck in analysis paralysis a perpetual debate between options that leaves you motionless in reality. Eliminate some of those forks right off the bat. Accept the uncertainty of action. Part of the reason we overthink is because we want to be thorough. If we're not thorough, we feel that we'll overlook something to disastrous results. We keep imagining that we'd be more prepared to minimize our chances of disastrous failure. We want complete certainty before we expose ourselves to risk, and thus, we never get off our couch. But there's no possible way for us to control everything in our world. Trying to do so is usually a surefire recipe for chaos, inefficiency, and massive disappointment. Because of it, we therefore have to allow the reality that we'll always have a certain degree of uncertainty in our lives. That's where we must start with this point. Any time you take action, you open yourself up to uncertainty, and this scares us. Cognitive therapist Dr. Robert Leahy explains why there is such dread over looming uncertainty. People worry because they think something bad will happen or could happen, so they activate a hypervigilant strategy of worry and think that, if I worry, I can prevent this bad thing from happening or catch it early. We believe that uncertainty or rather the lack of certainty, will lead to a bad outcome. We still feel this way if the uncertainty ends up creating a negligible or even positive effect after the fact. Therefore, we hold predictability as the highest standard and volatile unpredictability as the lowest. Uncertainty equals disaster. Inaction feels 100% predictable and therefore safe. That's nowhere close to the truth. Nevertheless, we spin our wheels and construct crude fortresses against the unpredictable. A healthier mindset doesn't just leave room for uncertainty, it embraces it. If you want complete assurance in the success of your actions, you're just waiting for something that has never been possible and is never going to show itself to you. You must come to terms with a low degree of discomfort through uncertainty in your life. After all, how much uncertainty do you already allow in your life as a regular occurrence? Every time you get in a vehicle, you're subjecting yourself to the unknown. Anytime you change cities, shift jobs, or take a vacation, you're taking a number of risks. But they're not standing in the way of your work or leisure. Why are they any different? All you can control is your actions, and outcomes are a completely separate matter. Uncertainty is inherent in any action, even if you've done it a thousand times before. You just feel more confident about it, so you ignore the uncertainty. 
You have no choice but to live with this uncertainty. So acceptance of it is just a step above that. Accept the reality, digest it, and allow that there's no immediate resolution. Then continue doing what you need to do. Knock out the required work like you normally would. Make rational and level-headed plans to find a new career if you have to. Develop your networks and friends for life away from the center of action. It's not easy to be uncertain, but there are simple ways to endure it and not let it overtake you. I know what you're thinking. If we accept uncertainty and merely embrace it, then what happens when we really do get a terrible outcome? Won't this cause us to underestimate how awful the uncertain thing really is? What if acceptance of whatever's out there causes us to disregard warning signs or cautions, and the whole thing becomes a catastrophe because we accepted uncertainty? And then, won't we be haunted by remorse for the rest of our lives because we didn't do enough? That's understandable, but I didn't say to ignore the possibility of uncertain adverse events. Accepting uncertainty isn't the same thing as dismissing it as irrelevant. What we're talking about is reasonable uncertainty. That means both a reasonable amount of uncertainty and what uncertainty could reasonably happen. For example, if you're opening a new shop on a busy street, there are a few things you could be reasonably worried about, given that you don't let such worries cripple your efforts. Getting absolute certainty is impossible. It will never happen. You'll just continue to seek it and never move ahead as a result. And some things will always be outside of your control, no matter how much you worry about them. Any type of action or movement you strive to take will carry uncertainty with it. It's unavoidable, but also freeing, because it changes your expectations. Takeaways and Action Steps Overthinking is exactly what you want to avoid in your quest to take action. You truly cannot think and do at the same time. So no matter how productive your mental machinations feel, just know that 99.99% .99 of the time, they're holding you back from what you should be doing. Overthinking is when your brain is too active with too much information. This is when you should employ the ostrich theory and willful ignorance to your benefit. Ostriches, of course, have been mythologized to bury their heads in the sand to avoid danger. Likewise, humans similarly ignore information to avoid danger. Use this to your advantage for once, and practice restricting your flow of information and inquiries to become willfully ignorant so you can focus on action rather than thinking. Action Step Limit the amount of information you take in. However many sources you typically consult, Cut them in half. Put a cap on your research and rumination time. Practice willful ignorance and realize that not everything is important or urgent. Try to ignore negative indicators based on immediacy, source, category, or diminishing returns. A pre-mortem analysis is when you analyze the potential causes of failure before you take action. How is this helpful? Because it makes you focus on one of the few important factors in action, failure, instead of spinning your wheels over other irrelevant aspects. Action step, perform a pre-mortem analysis. But make sure that you don't just add this train of thought to your mental to-do list. It should replace the other topics you think about. Work backwards from your normal train of thought. Ask yourself how potential failures will occur, what the likely causes are, and what solutions you can implement. Chances are, most of your mental chatter is not focused in this most important direction. A don't-do list is predicated on the fact that most of us know what we should be doing. We're usually just avoiding it or procrastinating. However, most of us get stuck in overthinking because we don't know what we shouldn't be doing. This list takes care of that and articulates three types of tasks for you to avoid. You may find that after eliminating these distractions, you'll be left with a clear path for what to take action on. Action step, create your don't do list. Make it as long and detailed as possible with the tasks that have diminishing returns, are waiting on other people, and don't add value to your goals. Have the intention of knowing exactly what to focus on after you're done. 
One of the biggest reasons we overthink uncertainty in the outcome, which is related to insecurity and fear. We want to be thorough to the point that we know we will not fail if we act. Unfortunately, that's impossible. And if you attempt it, you're just going to stay on the sidelines, searching for something that doesn't exist. Uncertainty, to most of us, is nearly synonymous with negativity, but that's not the reality. Uncertainty is omnipresent in everything we do, and it is actually freeing to change your expectations. Once you accept uncertainty, you'll be willing to risk a little more and take to action a bit quicker. Action Step Think about the ways you already accept uncertainty in your life. In fact, compose a short list and rate the relative probabilities and levels of danger. You could be hit with a car every time you cross the road. Eventually, when you accept that fact, it just fades into background static. Remember this when you're faced with something potentially nerve-wracking or fearful. The best way to predict the future is to create it. Unknown. One of the many problems with a lifetime of not taking action is that your first instinct will be to freeze. You may feel that it's safer to maintain the status quo instead of making a move, or you may just feel uncomfortable acting without analyzing things to death. Whatever the case, you found yourself unconsciously erring on the side of inaction. You may have heard of what's known as the fight-or-flight response. This is when we interpret a stimulus in the world to be dangerous, which ratchets up our adrenaline and alertness and readies our bodies to either flee at full speed or engage in a fight to the death. What's less frequently mentioned is that this response actually has a third component, freezing. For most, this is when the adrenaline rush is so extreme that we are essentially left frozen in shock. For those who have made a habit of avoiding action, this is our default response no matter what happens. It's easier said than done to break these patterns, but this chapter contains a few ways to err on the side of action and get moving more frequently and consistently. Getting a little uncomfortable The action you want rarely happens when you're in your comfort zone. In fact, that's probably true with anything you want. It's not going to come easy, and you will have to endure something uncomfortable, new, and difficult to achieve it. If you're too comfortable with your current job, you won't feel the need to push your boundaries to seek a promotion or pay raise. You won't learn new skills or strive for something better. You figure that good enough is good enough, and so inaction will be your way of living. We call this sort of sloth comfortable inaction. Things may not be ideal, but you're comfortable enough, or not uncomfortable enough, and thus no action will be taken. You can think of it as your tolerance for discomfort being higher than average. It's knowing that you're slowly gaining weight but not changing your eating habits because you can still squeeze into your favorite pair of jeans. Or, for instance, it's understanding that your business's monthly revenues have been decreasing by 5% for five months, but not changing your business model because you're still paying your bills without a problem. Comfortable inaction can also rear its head in small, everyday occurrences like lying in bed, being slightly cold, but not wanting to get out of bed to close your windows. You'd be warmer and more comfortable if you took action, but without it, you feel adequate and like you would be able to fall asleep regardless. Whatever your short-term needs and desires, they are being adequately met, so there's no reason to change your life around. Initially, comfortable inaction may seem completely harmless. After all, you already found ways to live with the problem or to mentally deal, right? You rationalized to yourself that if something urgent happened, you'd be able to spring into action. But who's to say that you wouldn't simply increase your threshold for discomfort and wave off most problems as issues you can just cope with? What makes comfortable inaction so damaging? Because everything compounds and grows over time, and if you're not careful, you will unknowingly end up in a situation that is untenable and far past any boundaries you may have set for yourself. This is best exemplified with a frog trapped in a pot of water that is slowly coming to a boil. If the frog was suddenly thrown in a pot of boiling water, he would jump out. But if he's in the water as it gradually grows hotter, then he doesn't perceive the growing danger and boils to death out of a lack of self-awareness. 
There may be urgent emergencies down the line, but for the time being, you're more comfortable doing nothing. Understand that even if you may be comfortable right now, it doesn't mean you will be so forever. Constantly settling is not how you get what you want in life. Stop setting aside things for later when you can handle them right now. Generally speaking, successful people have a bias for action. Their default mode is to spot issues and then execute as fast as possible because they know that's the only way to get what they want in this world. They don't get sidetracked by distraction, fears, or even comfort. Perhaps they have even conditioned themselves to be uncomfortable with inaction, an enviable mental space to occupy. The human mind is great at coming up with excuses for not taking a risk. After all, why would you want to change anything if you're already in an acceptable situation? This is the million-dollar question. How can you use this knowledge of comfortable inaction to avoid falling into its trap? Picture that you're living in a house in Hawaii close to a volcano. In one scenario, you turn on the news radio to hear that researchers have estimated that the volcano near you will be active within the next 100 years. You figure you won't be around to care, so in action it is for you. In another scenario, you turn on the news radio and discover that researchers have estimated the volcano to be active within the following two months. You start packing up your belongings in cardboard boxes immediately. What's the difference? Inaction was no longer comfortable. In fact, it was painful. Thus, to break out of comfortable inaction, you must make inaction as uncomfortable as possible. Imagine all the long-term and short-term consequences of inaction with as much detail as you can. Project into the future and visualize all the eventualities. In fact, let your imagination run wild as you picture the potential failure, rejection, and how far behind you'll be. This helps in two main ways. First, it snaps you to awareness of what's at stake in your life beyond your current sense of laziness. Second, amplifying pains and discomforts creates a sense of urgency that will push you to act to stop that pain. Suppose you've been dreaming about leaving your desk job and building something of your own, but you never actually do it because you're comfortable with receiving a fixed amount on a fixed date to pay your bills. It seems like a pretty reasonable excuse to stay in your zone of inaction, right? But think about all the opportunities you're missing, as well as the ways you're stifling your growth by staying. Amplify the positives from action and negatives from inaction. Positives from action. You could be earning more money, or you could be working for only four hours a week instead of 40. You could be going on a nice vacation every month, or even better, working from exotic locales. You could be proud of building something from the ground up. You could retire early. You could laugh at all your naysayers. You could be your own boss instead of a perpetual cog in the machine. You've always dreamed of working for yourself. Your worst-case scenario is to end up exactly where you are right now. Negatives from inaction. You're miserable at your job. You hate your supervisors. You have a long commute. You'll never advance further than you already have. You don't feel passionately about your work. Competition increases every day. Both your opportunity and ambition will decrease with age. You're never going to build a business, if not now. Is it really that scary to take a risk on something you've never tried before? When you think about it hard enough, you might realize that inaction is actually a lot scarier. Inaction amounts to a lot of wasted time, but taking action makes wasted time impossible. Tiny Steps Very few people want to go to work when it's raining cats and dogs outside. It's an enormous burden to overcome mentally. You'll get soaked, your shoes and socks will be puddles, and you'll freeze from head to toe. Oh, and your only umbrella's broken. It's such a burden that you don't even want to go through the motions of getting dressed and putting on your boots. You feel defeated before you even begin. Sometimes a horrendously rainy day can feel just like trying to take action and get started. When we're faced with huge tasks that feel insurmountable, it's like looking through a window out at the rain. It's such an obstacle that everything feels impossible and pointless. We drag our feet, discourage ourselves, and bitterly complain the whole time. Most of us will probably just stay inside the entire day 
with a cup of hot chocolate and never get our day started. Similarly, a single huge task, such as finish the 200-page report, can certainly sound imposing, if not impossible. It's just so discouraging to start something like that because you feel that it will never end and you'll never make any progress. To some extent, that's true because even writing 10 pages is only completing 5% of the task. Imagine how hopeless you would feel. However, what if you were to break up that monumental project into tiny, easy, individual tasks you could get to work on immediately, as well as see instant progress? For example, preparing the template, finding the first three sources, creating a bibliography, outlining 500 words of the first section, and so on. Actually, it can go much smaller yet. Choosing the fonts, writing the chapter titles, organizing the desk, formatting the document, turning the computer on, sitting down for five minutes, or writing just one sentence. The smaller the better. Otherwise, you're starting each day staring at the equivalent of a torrential downpour. When you break up your tasks into as tiny pieces as possible, you're creating ways to keep your brain happy and motivated for action. Anything difficult is only a series of easy things. One of the biggest hurdles to taking action is looking at tasks as huge, inseparable boulders. It's intimidating and discouraging, and when those emotions arise, it's easy to avoid action because tackling a boulder is a tough sell. Unfortunately, this is a habit that plagues most people. They see only massive boulders and allow themselves to get emotionally thrown off track. Break up your big tasks into smaller activities and keep repeating until the tasks you have before you are so easy you can do them within a few minutes. Create small, manageable chunks that will be psychologically uplifting and acceptable, and you'll increase your action instantly. Make your to-do list as long and articulated as possible, with as many small tasks as you can list. Instead of boulders, think in terms of pebbles. A pebble is something you can handle instantly, without any effort and even with little thought. In fact, make each task so small that it's almost like you're not doing anything at all. Can you start a fire with only big logs? You might be able to, but it would be difficult. It's much easier to start with kindling, paper scraps, and small pieces of wood that burn easily. Small steps can take you to the top of the hill and let you roll down the other side to seize momentum. They help you break the inertia that leads to passivity. Let's take an example that we're all familiar with, working out. You want to lose 100 pounds, a hefty goal. If you go into the gym every day thinking that you want to lose 100 pounds, you're going to fail. It's a huge, enormous boulder of a goal. It might sound grand to proclaim, but in reality, it's going to be very hard to stick to because of how unbelievable it sounds. You won't see much progress on a daily or even weekly basis, and you'll understandably become discouraged. It's too much to face at one time, like the rainy day from the beginning of the chapter. So, what if you approach your weight loss target by breaking it into small, manageable increments, goals, and tasks? This might look something like setting a reasonable weekly weight loss goal, creating daily objectives of eating specific foods, and not eating others, and drinking water every hour. Eat 100 fewer calories per meal. Go on walks after each meal. Drink only half your soda. Eat five fewer fries each meal. Cook once a week. Buy the low-calorie version of snacks. Substitute water for fruit juice. Now, those sound much more palatable and achievable. Easy, even. If you hit your weekly weight loss goal and successfully drink water every hour, it's far easier to stay motivated and focused. Meeting your smaller weekly target will give you a sense of accomplishment, whereas making an insignificant dent in your total goal, 100 pounds, will only leave you feeling discouraged and as if the task ahead is too great to achieve. These are small tasks that, if done consistently and correctly, will lead to your overall goal of losing 100 pounds. These tiny steps and frequent victories will encourage and motivate you to take action. Depending on your mood, even saying, I'm going to write 200 words can feel like a 20-mile march to the sea, 
In this case, it's not even a tiny step. It's a portion of a step that we struggle with. One way to get the ball rolling, no matter how you feel, is to change your phrasing. I'm going to finish that turns into, I'm going to get started on that. The point of this, just like with tiny steps, is to make your threshold for starting as low as possible. In fact, you want to make it so low that it's nearly indistinguishable from the laziness of not acting at all. The 4070 Rule Former U.S. Secretary of State Colin Powell has a rule of thumb about coming to a point of action. He says that any time you face a hard choice, you should have no less than 40% and no more than 70% of the information you need to make that decision. In that range, you have enough knowledge to make an informed choice, but not so much intelligence that you lose your resolve and inject hesitation and paralysis into your considerations. If you have less than 40% of the information you need, you're essentially shooting from the hip. You don't know quite enough to move forward and will probably make a lot of mistakes. Conversely, if you chase down more data until you get more than 70% of what you need, and it's unlikely that you'll truly need anything above this level, you could get overwhelmed and become uncertain. The opportunity may have passed you by, and someone else may have beaten you by starting already. This is the zone of inaction. You want 100% information, and although it's never possible, it's a zone of safety. Safety from uncertainty, insecurity, and all the rest. But in that sweet spot between 40 and 70%, you have enough to go on and can let your intuition guide your decisions. In the context of Colin Powell, this is where effective leaders are made. The people whose instincts point in the right direction are the ones who will lead their organization to success. This is also where you should battle procrastination before it becomes too late. You should feel a certain amount of uncertainty, or even lack of confidence. It's natural, and anything else is an unrealistic expectation. More often than not, what you're searching for will only be gained through beginning. As mentioned, the first step will be your most valuable tool in learning and preparation, rather than hours of planning. We can replace the word information with other motivators. 40 to 70 percent of experience, 40 to 70 percent reading or learning, 40 to 70 percent competence, or 40 to 70 percent planning. While we're taking action, we learn, gain confidence, and gain momentum. When you try to achieve more than 70% information, or confidence, experience, etc., your lack of speed can destroy your momentum or stem your interest, effectively meaning nothing's going to happen. There's a high likelihood of gaining nothing further from surpassing this threshold. For example, let's say you're opening up a cocktail bar, which involves buying a lot of different types of liquor. You're going to wait until you're 100% ready with your liquor before opening. Yet, you can't expect to have absolutely all the liquor you'll ever need when the doors are ready to open. It's impossible to be able to serve any drink a customer orders. So, applying this rule, you'd wait until you had at least 40% of your available inventory prepared. This would establish momentum. Then, if you get more than half of what you need, you'd be in pretty good shape to open. You might not be able to make absolutely every drink in the bartender's guide, but you'll have enough on hand to cover the staple drinks with a couple variations. If you have around 50 to 60% inventory, you're more than ready. When the remaining inventory arrives, you'll already be in action and can just incorporate that new inventory into your offerings. If you waited until you had 70% or more inventory to open, you could find yourself stuck in neutral for longer than you wanted to be. Imagine what would happen if you waited until you had 100% of what you needed rare vintages of wines, and exotic vodkas from across the world. You'd never open. So, let's simplify. If you want to arrange a date, you only need three elements. Who, when, and where. If you need to find a hospital, you only need to know the specialist you want to see, the cost, and the location. If you want to start a business, you only need to think about what you can do tomorrow to move toward your goal, not necessarily what your ideal business is you'll end up with more action than not. 
Waiting until you have 40% of what you need to make a move isn't a way of staying inside your comfort zone. You're actively planning what you need to do to get out, which is just fine, as long as it's not over-planning. For all intents and purposes, the minimum effective dose of information or preparation you need is far lower than you imagine it to be. Beat indecision. Action has many enemies. Excessive planning, perfectionism, fear, laziness, just to name a few. It's a shame, because each of those enemies, despite whatever protective instinct they fulfill, only serves one purpose, to keep you still. An underestimated enemy of action is indecision. Unlike other parts of inaction that are plagued by laziness or plain avoidance, you may actually have a good intent with indecision. You want to take action, but the problem is that you're incapable of choosing from what's in front of you. In part, the don't-do list and pre-mortem analysis can help you with indecision, but here are some specific ways to make decisions quicker than you ever thought possible. The first point on defeating indecision is to realize that almost every choice is reversible to some degree. Almost nothing is forever and immediately harmful. There's usually some sort of grace period when nothing is permanent if you don't wish it to be. Therefore, it makes sense to dip your toes into one option to see what happens and gain some information instead of standing at the fork in the road until you starve to death. Make a decision with the full intent of backtracking. You'll feel better making it because you see an easy route out, but you've just broken your inertia. You can learn so much more by taking an option, even for a bit, than from hemming and hawing at the crossroads. Only in the process will you learn more about it and how it feels. In essence, commit to an option and follow it for a while because it's probably reversible, and you learn more from committing and following through. If you are trying to decide between moving to New York or Texas, are you going to gain more information by visiting neither and continuing to debate with yourself, or by visiting one, seeing how you feel about it, and going through some motions to gain information? You'd visit Texas and start looking into rental prices, how to attain your driver's license, the local job economy, and the prevalence of healthy food. Make a small commitment, follow the path, and then reevaluate again. The important part is getting away from complete stillness. Second, apply strict boundaries to help you make the choice for you. This streamlines your process and reduces the amount of thinking you have to do. For example, if you're struggling with what restaurant to pick for dinner, you might apply filters of healthy, inexpensive, within a 10-minute drive, and not hamburgers. After you set these parameters, you might only have one or two choices left over. It's like when you shop online and apply filters for size, style, price, and color. Suddenly, you're left with only two shirts to buy. If you're left with zero choices, remove one or two filters and work backward until you can make an easy, yet satisfactory decision. You'll be left with options that are within your criteria, and at that point, what does it really matter? You can choose at random at this point, with no loss in happiness or effectiveness, and you've successfully ignored everything that you don't care about. A corollary to setting boundaries is to first identify a default choice if you can't decide within a set amount of time. Pick your default up front, and then set a time limit where if you can't choose something else, you automatically go with the default. For instance, with your significant other, your default restaurant is an Italian joint. If you can't choose a different restaurant within five minutes, then to Italy you go. This saves time, but the act of creating the default is important because you'll have automatically selected something that fits your requirements or desires. You'll be happy in either case, in other words. In many instances, the default is what you had in mind the entire time and where you're probably going to end up regardless of the endless debate. You go through the mental exercise of choosing a default with the idea that you accept ending up there even if you considered other choices. For the third aspect of conquering indecisiveness, realize that you might have a drive to make the perfect decision with absolutely no downside, no opportunity costs, and no second thoughts. Well, that's tough to do on a daily basis. Instead of seeking perfection, seek satisfaction of your needs. That's what really matters 
for 99% of our decisions. If something checks all your boxes, that's all you need to beat your indecision. When you aim for perfection, you tend to start running up against the law of diminishing returns, which states that the amount of effort you put into something is no longer worth the return you gain. Oh, and a perfect decision is also usually impossible or non-existent. For example, you might spend $100 on a pair of nice shoes. At that price point, they'll be well-constructed, sturdy, and fashionable. What if you were to spend $2,000 on a similar pair of shoes? They'd still be well-constructed, sturdy, and fashionable. So in most instances, consider the primary goal of your action. Shoes take you from point A to point B and should contain a modicum of style. This begs the question, were the price of your shoes worth the extra money over the cheaper pair? For most people, no. There's a law of diminishing returns where the more expensive shoes don't make a difference in any relevant way. How nice can a pair of shoes get? Unless the more expensive shoes are self-cleaning with automatic lacing, you're spending more for essentially the same return. You probably aren't shooting for life-changing restaurants every night of the week. In this case, your compulsion to make a perfect choice is wasted energy. Eating is the goal, not choosing a perfect meal. Unless you're making life-impacting choices that you will feel the repercussions of for years, attempting to make a perfect choice is silly. The difference between the perfect choice and the good enough choice will be negligible, and you might not even feel it or remember it the next day. There won't be consequences that make a difference in the long term, so what's the sense in spending additional time on it? In fact, aim for adequate or even imperfect and flawed. Suddenly, you'll see that it's far easier to make a decision if you lighten up the standards that you've probably arbitrarily placed on yourself. A famous comedian has clever input on this matter. My rule is that if you have someone or something that gets 70% approval, you just do it, because here's what happens. The fact that other options go away immediately brings your choice to 80, because the pain of deciding is over. This is surprisingly similar to what former Secretary of State Colin Powell has to say on the matter. Fourth, to make better and quicker decisions, engage in intentionally judgmental thinking. This is the type of thinking you've probably tried to repress, but it will be very beneficial for your decision-making. Think in black and white terms and reduce your decisions down to one to three main points. Overgeneralize and don't look at the subtleties of your options. Willfully ignore the gray area, and don't rationalize or justify statements by saying, but, or, that's not always true. Focus on what really moves the needle for you, and ignore things that, while they matter, aren't the most important. Sometimes, consuming less information will help this process because you're focused on a smaller set of factors. Let's go back to the example of choosing a restaurant for dinner. How can you think more in black and white terms about something like this? Simply reduce your restaurant choices down to what you might categorize as a first impression. Restaurant A is a place for burgers, despite the fact that there are five menu items that are not burgers. It doesn't matter. In black and white terms, it's a burger place. Restaurant B is expensive, despite the fact that it has five cheaper items. It doesn't matter. In black and white terms, it's expensive. Restaurant C is far away, even though if you hit good traffic, it's not too far. It doesn't matter. In black and white terms, it is far. Seeing options in black and white basically generalizes their traits and removes their subtleties. Remember, if we're talking about destroying indecision, this is one of the best things you can do. If you have a hazy stereotype of your two options and the stakes are relatively low, then that's all the information you need. A final method to be intentionally judgmental is to sum up your options in one short sentence only. No commas or addendums allowed. You aren't allowed to elaborate on anything. When you try this, you'll notice you can only end up with broad strokes, such as, it's a burger place that's 10 minutes away versus, well, they serve burgers, but they also have lasagna and tacos. It's 10 minutes away, 
but I think we can get there faster. Which one is going to be easier for you to ignore or accept? Remember, the idea is faster action and not necessarily trying to optimize every decision that you come across. Making quick decisions is certainly a major pillar in erring on the side of action. Consider that indecision is another name for overthinking, and remember, we can't think and do at the same time. For the purposes of this book, motion is always preferred to analysis, beyond a certain extent. Limit consumption for more production. It happens all the time. You're sitting down, trying to get in some reading, and by the time you look up, hours have passed. Losing track of time in this pursuit is great if you're being productive, but reading is only productive when it adds actual value to our lives. More often than not, it doesn't. Consuming information is almost always seen as a net positive. It's what we believe underlies being educated and intelligent, and reading, in particular, is seen as superior to more passive forms of media consumption. The point is that it's easy to feel like we're being productive by reading, when all we're actually doing is wasting time in a slightly more intellectual way than binge-watching Game of Thrones. When we justify our information consumption in this way, what we're really doing is justifying our procrastination. We use information as a procrastination tool. Reclaim your lost time and get started by going on an information diet. Information diets aren't about being less educated or cutting out leisure reading. They're simply about considering our end goals and if we are unconsciously doing something detrimental to those goals. Too often, and too easily, we get sucked into information, and when we consume, we cannot produce. But how do we decide what information is worth consuming and what's worth leaving on the shelf? How do we even know what information is sucking up our time? Begin by taking an honest look at how you spend your time. You can do this in the following steps. 1. Survey your information consumption. 2. Remove at least 50% of the least valuable content you consume and cut the noise from your information diet. 3. View descriptions of information pieces as pitches for your time and attention. 4. Say no more often. 5. Consider cutting entire information forms from your life. 6. Monitor how much of any one information source you're consuming. For one week, make a list of every type of media you consume, from your Facebook feed to War and Peace. It's important to know exactly where your time is going so you can make cuts. You might be surprised to find you're scrolling through social media feeds for hours per day. Or you may discover that you spend far too many hours inhaling the latest bestseller. It doesn't matter what you're consuming when you begin this process. What matters is that you identify where your time is going so that you can redirect it toward activities that need to get done. After you make your list, you'll see a lot of different mediums. Social media, books, magazines, television, podcasts, and similar items will probably populate your list. Some are genuinely valuable. They help you be more creative, bring you joy, and make you and your life better. They assist you in your work, or they're flat-out required research to keep you progressing and growing. This doesn't all have to be edifying. Genuinely enjoying a TV show or other product can be a good enough reason to keep it in your life. But right off the bat, you can also see that some of these are useless and keep you stuck in inaction. You'll find a lot of items that you didn't actively choose to watch or read. They were just there, in front of you, and you consumed them on autopilot. Autopilot, as unconscious consumption, is the real enemy here. You can tell something should be cut out of your life when it has no current or practical utility. Only information we can immediately apply to our current situation is important. This is what happens when we fall into the Wikipedia rabbit hole, for instance, suddenly we end up learning about 17th century woodworking when we're only trying to become knowledgeable about one historical figure. Hypothetical or just-in-case information can also be useful, but most of the time it shouldn't be your current focus. 
This is like researching the type of clothing you should buy when you lose 50 pounds. It's a legitimate concern, but not at the present moment. Plenty of other information you take in will be downright useless. You neither enjoy it nor find facts within it that can be applied to better your life. It was just placed in front of you, and you consumed it without realizing it. These are cereal boxes, advertisements, and vapid entertainment news that are just entertaining enough to suck us in, but are mostly without substance. Once you cut out 50% of the least useful media you consume, you'll have that much more spare time to devote to the things you've been putting off. That's way better than wasting time skimming through posts or blankly watching a show you don't care about. This tactic in itself isn't a cure for procrastination, but it does help when you're at a fork in the road. And if a distraction is less handy, it's one less obstacle to working. It helps to view television, books, articles, and podcasts as pitches for your time and attention. Both are finite. Everything we consume also consumes our time and energy. In addition, we can't produce at the same time as we're consuming. It's impossible to do both at once. At this point, it should be obvious that being entertained or educated doesn't come free of cost, even when no money is being charged. Even when items are free, they're not without cost to your work and productivity. Given all of this, it makes sense to be discriminating about what we spend our time consuming and to be especially careful before we let something new catch our eye. Before watching or reading anything, even something you know you'll like, read or listen to a short description and consider whether the object is worth your time. You can even do this with works you already know by consciously reminding yourself what you're going to find before loading up a website or sitting down for a film. The important thing here is consciousness. When we think about the cost of frittering away time on subpar entertainment, we're less likely to indulge or to waste time. In addition to considering the inherent cost of consuming information, there's a much simpler way to change our habits. Commit to saying no. Merely deciding to stop indulging in media a set number of times, say three times per week, can radically change how we interact with the world. Without consciously setting limits, it's easy to see keeping up with friends on social media as an obligation or to feel like we have to finish watching the show we like, but none of that's compulsory. At all points, we control our action. We can always say no. While filtering things out of your life and preventing your newfound autonomy from being snatched from you, consider the mediums that deliver low-value information to you. Often, we find ourselves drifting back to the same time sinks over and over again. When we notice these patterns, it's worth considering excising the whole medium from our lives. Whether it's getting rid of cable TV, committing to a life without social media, or deciding to spend less time reading books, making a decisive change can prevent the need to say no over and over again. Finally, Consider how much time you're sinking into all of the remaining forms of media you consume. How much time is spent on television, reading, listening to podcasts, or scrolling through feeds? If you spend too long in any one place, it's likely you're devoting time to those activities because they're automatic, not because you're really enjoying them. Cutting back in those areas can leave more time for the good things in life. Learning to make cutbacks on attention expenditures lets us focus on information that helps us grow, learn, and thrive. Fortunately, the process of reducing the noise from your media streams can be approached in many ways, allowing anyone to make small or even major changes in their routines. Once we've established a newer, more conscious routine, it'll be that much easier to find time for the people and things we truly love and to finish tasks we'd otherwise be inclined to set aside. That sure beats being constantly stressed about the work we're avoiding. Takeaways and Action Steps What does it mean to err on the side of action? Simply, it means that instead of freezing or analyzing, you should attempt to make your default response action. Have an action bias. 
The first way to err on the side of action is to break through what's known as comfortable inaction. This is where you feel that things are good enough, so you might as well not disrupt the status quo. This is where we get sayings like, good is the enemy of great, and so on. But it's true. You'll never live the way you want if you're too comfortable where you are now. Action step. You aren't uncomfortable enough to take action, so increase the amount of discomfort that comes along with inaction so you have no choice but to act. For something you're trying to break past a plateau on, allow your imagination to run wild on the various negative consequences you'll face. Think about the rewards you'll miss. Think about the short and long-term repercussions. Once these seem more urgent and tangible, action will be far easier. It's tough to get started when you're facing something huge. You already dread it because you know it will not feel rewarding, and you won't be able to finish anytime soon. That in itself is discouraging. Therefore, break up your tasks into as tiny steps as possible, steps so small that it's almost no different from your status quo of inaction. Action step. Break down a task you've been dreading into 10 small individual steps. Can you break it down into 15? And then 20? How does it feel to achieve something, no matter how small? I bet it feels great. The 40-70 rule, popularized by Colin Powell, states that you should get started with no less than 40% of the information you feel is necessary, but no more than 70%. For our purposes, focus on getting started with 40%, what might feel like an insufficient amount of information, but in reality, you've already hit the point of diminishing returns, and anything else will be learned more effectively along the way. Action Step Apply the 40-70 rule to elements other than information, confidence, planning, learning, and preparing. Write down the top 10 details you need to complete something. Now, try eliminating three of those details. Did it make a difference? For that matter, how many of the 10 do you actually need to get started? To simply begin, you likely need nowhere close to 10. Indecision is basically overthinking by another name, and it is an equivalent obstacle to erring on the side of action and gaining momentum. Indecision is defeatable in many ways, with the common thread between many of the methods being some sort of pickiness. Action Step Attempt to apply all the tactics described to something you're having trouble deciding on. These include commit with the intent of backtracking, apply strict boundaries, utilize a default choice, seek satisfactory choices over perfect ones, engage in intentionally judgmental thinking, and be purposefully general and vague. Which one works best for you and helps you reach a decision the quickest? Finally, you can limit your information consumption. Very little of what we consume is helpful or even relevant. Most of it is also consumed unconsciously without us realizing that we're spending so much time and effort on it. We get sucked in. Cultivate self-awareness, curate your consumption, and reduce your media sources so you can devote your limited energy toward work and motion. Action Step Make a list of what you consume for a week and make a resolution to cut down on at least 50% of it. Preview information before you engage with it and view everything as a pitch for your time and energy. This has been Take Rapid Action. Get productive, motivated, and energized. Stop overthinking and procrastinating. Written by Patrick King. Narrated by Russell Newton. Copyright 2019 by Peter Hollins. Production copyright by Peter Hollins.